Hey there, you're about to watch a fairly long video, and if that is your kind of thing, I urge you to check out these other two pretty long videos I've worked on recently. Even if you've never played the games before, you might learn something new, you might find something you like, who knows? What is there to say about Sonic the Hedgehog 1 at this point that hasn't been said a million times already? Well, if I may be so bold, this was the beginning of the end. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Garrelus64, and I know that was a little bit pessimistic, but uh, it was just a joke. You know, mostly. I really can't believe this series is actually gonna be 30 years old once June of this year rolls around, which is about 5 years older than I am now. And if there's one thing I can thank it for, it's that I will never be able to disappoint the amount of people that this series has in my entire lifetime, no matter how hard I try. And that is a huge self-esteem boost for me. Before we get too into this though, I want to bring up something that a lot of people seem to talk about, and that's the fact that not a whole lot of people like Sonic 1, and they prefer Sonic 2 and Sonic 3. And while I do prefer Sonic 3 and Mania, if you count that as part of the classic series, which I do, Sonic 1 I have always valued above Sonic 2, and I know you're about to start frothing at the mouth in the comment section after hearing that, but you need to hear me out. That was how I thought of things... until now. It's funny, because as much as people don't want to admit it, I feel like the Sonic and Mario series are running at a very weird parallel, because in the Mario series, I really never see too many people talking about Mario 1 like, oh man, it's so good, it's such a great game, yada yada, because I don't, I don't think it's that great. I would take Mario 2 over Mario 1 any day. But again, I just said, the same thing does not apply to Sonic for me. But as I said a second ago, you can put down your pitchforks and angry comments. I have seen the light. There are a lot of lights around here, actually, to make the green screen work. I don't like Sonic 1 very much anymore after I played it for today's video. But why is that? Before we get into the meat of this one, though, I need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Slick Deals. Slick Deals is a browser extension and website that will help you save money for the very low price of absolutely free. With only a few clicks, the browser extension will be installed, and then you're able to see a ton of coupons that Slick Deals can apply to your purchase automatically. That's not all, though. If you check out the deals section, you can actually see some pretty slick deals. Now I see why they called it that on whatever website you might be browsing on. For instance, on eBay here, I found these waterproof wireless headphones that are usually $170, but they're only $40 right now. And you know, apparently the way of the future is wireless headphones, since the phone I just upgraded to no longer has a headphone jack. And as much as that upsets me, for $40, I guess I'll just get over it. So I don't know what you're waiting for. I would have downloaded this thing already, because money saving? That's some good stuff. I mean, one click, free download, and you get access to the best deals online all in one place. And and did I mention that that link you can click is right down in the description. It is my referral link, and if you click on it, it will help the channel a great deal. So go ahead and do that, help yourself, help me, and now I will get out of your way so you can watch this video. Since this is the first step in a whole new Sonic marathon, I wanted to start things off right, so I went and grabbed my real Sega Genesis, and in a very unorthodox approach for me, I was gonna play the entire game on the original hardware, just because it felt right, just felt in that moment the correct thing to do. And I powered on my Genesis, and it was like, nope, sorry, too old. I, it might just be the power cord or something. But uh, then I just went and played the Android port instead, because I don't care. Because you try to do something cool for once, and then the universe is like, Ooh! And let me tell you, there is no shortage of ways to play this game, because it's been ported to about as many things as Skyrim, aside from, like, the Amazon... Robot. Which still feels kind of weird. Oh. Robot lady. Play Skyrim. Welcome back to Skyrim, Adventurer. You had chosen to walk towards a spooky lighthouse. The Sega Ages port of the game on Switch is also a really good idea to try out because it adds the drop dash? Like, are you kidding me? Yes, it's great. I like the drop dash a lot, but not enough to mess up my Switch's home menu because we still don't have any manual organization or folders. Four years into the console's lifespan, I'm going to lose it. Hey, want to see me scare a Sonic fan? <laughs> yeah, that'll get him. I have talked about Green Hill so many times already in the handheld marathon, and now I guess I'm gonna do it all over again in the console one. It's green, it's a hill, it's iconic, it's overused. But back in Sonic 1, it hadn't been overused yet. And it kills me to say this as primarily a Mario fan, but I don't think anything from Mario 1 comes even close to the iconic nature of Green Hill Zone. Barring the music, of course. Because, I mean, if you look at it, like, we don't really see that original aesthetic from Mario 1 referenced all that much, aside from the question mark blocks that are still everywhere. But, like, you know, old Blockland really just isn't referenced in its entirety 
aside from like some small cameos here and there. So I guess what I'm trying to say, and it's not something I say very often, Sonic Team did something right here. And then they kept doing it until it was wrong. Which is a shame, because I really like Green Hill. I'd like, sue me, I don't care. There's my address. Sue me. It's set up in such a way that it perfectly teaches you about things that are really important to the game, such as momentum and the path system they have set up. I.e., if you're able to platform sufficiently, you're able to take the top path and it's a lot faster, but if you're a dumb idiot baby like me, you fall down here even though you've played the game a hundred times, and you're forced to go slower as a punishment. You'll probably also make it to the end of the stage with 50 rings the first time you play it regardless, because it's pretty easy, and that shows you how to access the special stages, which are required for 100%. Now, I like these things moderately more than the half-pipe plague that's been infecting the rest of the series since Sonic 2, but I didn't really spring for the emeralds this time around, because I know there was no Super Sonic in the original Sonic one, I know there is in the Android port, but I, I just, I'm looking at the original right now, and there's no Super Sonic boss fight, of course, by extension. So I decided to not do that at the end of the day, because I play video games to have fun and not to be stressed out. If I wanted to be stressed out, I'd play a game full of jump scares, like, uh... None of, none of these, because I don't want to play any of them. And I made that decision in the second act of Green Hill Zone, because even if you make it to the end of the stage with all the rings you need, sometimes this can happen. And of course, this is not the game's fault. That was definitely on me, because I didn't slow down in time. But also, I'm going to take it as a personal attack, and I will never forgive this game for it. This being Sonic's first adventure... No, no, not you. But it will be your time soon. This being Sonic's first outing, of course, things are a little bit different than what we know now. For instance, uh, Sonic Team used to be able to count to three, but they can't anymore. If you're going for the Emeralds, you will not be able to get one in the third act of any zone because Eggman is watching and Sonic gets a little bit shy, so we beat the ever-loving out of him because the only thing he's got on his side is a slow-moving wrecking ball and we're the fastest thing alive. It's just times like this where I question Eggman's high IQ because he either underestimates his enemies all the time or he just took one of those online tests that tells you your iq after you give them your email but it actually just steals your credit card information and you know now that i say that i'm pretty sure that's the only time eggman's digits have ever been taken by anyone <laughs> hey yo okay and now i don't like the game anymore because we're in marble zone banger song in the background and mario's been imprisoned in the marble following <laughs> nintendo's <laughs> removal of him on march 31st but you can say goodbye to going fast, and hello to being patient, every Sonic fan's favorite pastime. I still don't understand the idea of them following up a level that was the perfect showcase of what they wanted this game to be, with a level that feels like it would be more at home in a Mario game. And don't get me wrong, I love Mario, but when I'm playing Sonic, like, I wanna zoom! Not, you know, be trapped in my tomb! To me, it's a rough stage where you get penalized if you try to take it too fast, and there's not too many places where you can even try to go fast in the first place. And strangely, this will be a theme throughout a majority of the rest of the zones. There's a lot of waiting around for level gimmicks to drop so you can continue platforming and pushing blocks to ride over lava safely. And you know, this game was pushing more than blocks, it was also pushing my I don't want to be here button every couple seconds. Unfortunately, one thing I noticed, aside from in Green Hill and one other stage, is that frequently, I just kind of wanted to turn the game off, and that's kind of sad, because it's not like I couldn't finish it, it's just I didn't want to. And I'm positive that if I was going for all the emeralds, I just flat out would have not finished the game, and... You know, I have beaten it before, so it's not a big deal, I can still talk about it, but, uh, this is a pretty huge change of perspective from what, uh, you know, I was thinking, like, the day before. Going along with the theme of the zone, Eggman of course tries to burn you at the end of it, but nothing could burn me more than the burnout I face on a day-to-day -day basis having been a content creator for almost four years now. Please like and subscribe. Springyard Zone is a breath of fresh air compared to all that smoke and ash we've been inhaling in the previous zone. This stage might be filled to the brim with bumpers that will bully you relentlessly if you're not careful, but at least you're able to take this stage at your own pace, assuming you can nail the platforming. It's not as fast-paced as Green Hill Zone, but it's okay because you actually get tested on the things you learned in that zone here, as opposed to what you get tested on in Marble Zone, which feels comparable to a math test being given by an English teacher. Spring Yard's boss, however, has nothing to do with Spring, so my respect for this man is dropping faster than his supposed IQ. Okay, so I promise you that when I started this review, I was going to come into it and I was going to say some nice things about Labyrinth Zone. But things change. I remember specifically at one point I was playing and in my head I was like, you know, 
maybe it's okay that we're going a lot slower than we should be. It's sort of relaxing. And then immediately I got hit with a spike ball and it threw me all the way back down a staircase I was climbing up. And that thought went away and it was replaced with pure violence. See, I think what my brain was doing was trying to protect me from the horrible experience I was enduring. And it didn't work even a little bit. I legitimately hate this. Like, some people might say, like, oh, well, you hate levels in other games, like, you know, for example, Rainbow Ride in Super Mario 64. But hey, in that game, I don't need to play Rainbow Ride. I don't need to play Shifting Sandland. I can get enough stars elsewhere to finish that game, and I'm totally fine. I don't need to sacrifice my enjoyment of the game to continue playing it. But here, it's like every time you play Sonic 1, you gotta do this. And... I'm not interested, sorry. Ship it back to the sender, I'll give you my phone, it's on my phone, I don't need it anymore. I said this before, but this level is like the literal antithesis to what this game is supposed to be, and I don't understand the thought process of putting this in here. Between waiting for slow-moving stage gimmicks and hunting down switches every two seconds, there was literally not one part of either of the first two acts that I enjoyed even a little bit. The third act is okay, like there are a couple areas here and there where I felt like I was going at an okay pace, but hell, by the end of this thing, there's not even a real boss fight. Eggman's just trying to leave too, like it's honestly the smartest decision I've seen to make this entire game. <sighs> okay, just breathe, breathe it out, it's fine, I get to talk about Starlight Zone now. Starlight Zone's my favorite, it's got my favorite aesthetic, it's got my favorite music, and despite it being littered with more bombs than in Sonic's entire catalog of games, I still have a blast playing this one. I think the most important thing is that Starlight Zone gives you a chance to like get out there and stretch your legs after being stuck in the idiot box for 22 minutes straight. And loops also come back, which we haven't seen since Green Hill Zone, and uh, I mean just don't get used to them because this is the last time you see them in this game. I'm not a huge fan of all the seesaw platforms throughout this stage because they kind of grind things to a halt every so often, but you know, in my expert opinion, and I feel like I speak for everybody, I think playing on a seesaw is at least moderately more enjoyable than drowning. Eggman agrees with us about the seesaws, so we decide to threaten his life with them to change his mind, and it works! Sonic is an absolute psychopath. Anything is a weapon in his hands. And now we're in the endgame. Eggman's good old mechanical zones, which are filled with uh, stolen vanishing blocks from Mega Man, I'm sure Dr. Wily's gonna have something to say about that, electrical hazards, and platforms that can't even hold Sonic's weight, so there's no way this area is up to code. Bam! You're welcome, we can just all go home now. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with this stage because I do, on one hand, feel like it's a culmination of everything you've learned throughout the quest, but on the other hand, there's a lot of little frustrations, like, you know, I'm sure this was just me, but these platforms, for some reason, I just could not jump onto them, and it's never happened to me before, so it just kind of felt like the game was taunting me, and, uh, you know, there is also the small matter of, uh, you know, Eggman confirming that he is an irredeemable bastard by dropping us back in the Labyrinth Zone! So this is the way they wanted to show us that Eggman was evil. Because let me tell you, he doesn't do anything even close to his evil in Sonic Forces. Like, null space who? Just throw him in the Labyrinth Zone again! He'll give up! I would! I don't know how long it took me to get out of there, but once I crawled out barely alive, I walked right into the final boss, which is just a chamber full of tons of insta-death traps. Hedgehog, it's time for your 5 p.m. crush death! Yes, Robotnik. I had a little bit of trouble with this one, but you know, once I took some time and calmed down, slow and steady wins the race. Which is definitely the lesson I was meant to take away from this Sonic the Hedgehog game. Sonic runs home and poses for the paparazzi, and Eggman revels in his new rock collection. The end. I really don't think I'm going to be playing this game again, which is kind of sad to write the whole thing off like that, but I didn't enjoy my time, and I think I get now why people always prefer Sonic 2 over this. It just took me a little bit longer to actually come to that conclusion. And if you're wondering what version of this to play, because like I said, there's a lot of them, I would say stick with the Christian Whitehead version, because it was completely remade for the new hardware. It has the widescreen, it's got the better frame rate, it's got a lot of bug fixes, it's got the optional spin dash, and a whole lot of other little things that you can change in the settings menu. And it also adds tails and knuckles for, like, an enhanced replayability thing. And I've never rated these games in a video before like this, but, you know, I would probably give Sonic 1, like, three Starlight Zones out of five. You're my new best friend. Ah! I have finally seen the light. Sonic 2 is the greatest video game ever made.
Which is what I would say if I believed that, but I don't. It's definitely better than Sonic 1, though. Sure, in the past, I was certain it was the other way around, but this time when I played it, it was from the perspective of someone who played the games back-to-back -back as opposed to taking a big break in between. And this time, of course, my Sonic 1 criticisms were very fresh on my mind, and Sonic 2, to my surprise, pretty much remedied every single one. Now, before we talk about the second best classic Sonic game, yes, it's not the best in my opinion, I wanted to ask you a question first. What do you like more, Sonic 1 or Sonic 2, and why? So our story begins in 1992, where only a year after Sonic 1, Sonic 2 hit shelves, and collectively I believe everyone in the universe just kicked Sonic 1 to the curb. Let's just look at the facts real quick, okay? Like, Sonic 2 is longer than Sonic 1, Sonic 2 gave the Chaos Emeralds an actual use that is definitely worth going for. It introduced Tails the Fox, who is an ultra-popular character to this very day, even though, you know, he doesn't really do anything in the modern games anymore. And would you look at that right there? What do we need Sonic 1 for? It doesn't even have the best Green Hill level anymore! Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Emerald Hill Zone. And yes, Sonic Team, we do know that that's just a synonym for green. Nice try. Much like in Sonic 1, this stage introduces you to your moveset and also the concepts of speed and momentum. Which, thankfully, unlike in Sonic 1, they are actually a lot more present. As opposed to being like that one weird relative you see only once a year at Christmas. Yeah, thank you, that was totally worth going through Labyrinth Zone for. New to Sonic 2, unless you played any port of Sonic 1 whatsoever, is the Spin Dash. Which, uh, if you know anything about me, I think the Drop Dash is the best thing since sliced bread. So basically, when this first came out, it must have been the best thing since, uh, sliced... Sliced Tamagotchis? Aside from the aforementioned green connection, I've also heard that this name might also be in reference to that you can collect all seven emeralds in Emerald Hill if you know what you're doing. And let me be the first to say, that ain't me. But imagine my surprise when uh, I entered the special stage after collecting 50 rings and passing the checkpoint, and I retried it because, you know, I'm not good at the special stages, and uh, when I left the special stage, the entire stage reset, and I was just able to grind out all seven emeralds in Emerald Hill Act 1. And some might call this cheating, but I don't care, I call it leveling the playing field. <laughs> One reason I didn't like this game before is because of the special stages themselves. This is the start of the half-pipe craze that hit the Sonic Nation like a, like a huge wave of sadness and, and boredom. From that point on, it was like just as overused as Green Hill in my opinion. I really wouldn't call these things special stages, I, I see them more as trial and error stages, and in my opinion that's almost never fun. Like my problem here lies with the fact that when you go into these things for the first time, you don't know where these rings are going to be, and it feels really hit or miss as to whether or not you're going to actually be able to accomplish it on your first try. And if you can't get it on your first shot, you gotta go collect 50 rings again outside, find a different checkpoint, and you gotta hold those rings the whole time until you get there, and in most cases, that is not a very easy thing to do, because sometimes stuff will just fly at you from off screen, or like you'll just get crushed to death randomly, and it's not really my idea of fun. Being able to retry the special stages like this in the Christian Whitehead version sort of evokes the same feelings for me as the Mega Man Zero and ZX collections. Both of these ports take something that's incredibly trial and error heavy and turns it into something that you can retry very quickly so it minimizes frustration as much as possible. Obviously, for Sonic 2, I'm talking about the special stages, being able to retry them over and over again until you actually memorize the patterns, and it's the exact same thing in Zero and ZX, where you can just keep doing those boss encounters instead of being reset to the start of the level every time you die four times. I cannot tell you how frustrating that was in the original Zero collection, and I still have no idea how I managed to beat those games when I was younger. I have no clue. I have no patience anymore. As for the thing about starting the level entirely over and just getting every emerald in Act 1, that, I will agree, is some super cheese, but you know what? Raise your hand if you don't like cheese. Yeah, that's what I thought. Literally no one. This had the added benefit for me of actually letting me enjoy my playthrough instead of having to worry about getting the emeralds in harder locations. And of course, you also get the benefit of Super Sonic, but uh, since I knew it was a little bit cheap the way I did it, I tried to not use Super Sonic that much. Though, you know, it is very easy to activate him by mistake, and, uh, you know, he doesn't really stop you from being a terrible player everywhere in the game. So, uh, I thought it was at least a little bit balanced. Oh, hey look, next up, that's the, uh, the place I have nightmares about. Chemical Plant is our first water level of the game, sort of. Uh, it's like most of the time you're safe above water, but, like, on occasion, it's like... You better hope you haven't walked under any ladders lately, or else you're dying for real. I'm gonna say something possibly controversial here, I think Chemical Plant is actually even more iconic than Green Hill was in Sonic 1. But as they keep reusing it, it sort of starts to lose its luster until, like, 
we get this, and it's like, I don't even know what happened to it here. Like, why does it look so bland and boring and watered down? Like, is it because it had to match everything else in the game? Wow, that was a burn, I think. I also respect Chemical Plant Zone more than Marble Zone, because even though it's slower than Emerald Hill as a whole, I was never quite as bored to tears as I was back when I was playing Sonic 1. There was no time to be bored, I was too busy being anxious. Hate that the story of my life. I also remember this boss being a little bit easier on the Genesis version, because you could wedge yourself in between Eggman and the wall. But, uh, you know, I guess widescreen gaming is a little bit of a blessing and a curse. So Aquatic Ruins, I don't like very much, but it's still a lot better than Labyrinth Zone. I just really don't like water levels in general. One thing I really don't like about this level is that I seem to get hit by a lot of tiny projectiles that are hard to see and also sometimes just even come off from on screen. But the water segments, I think I actually got pretty lucky this time around because typically the bubbles will wait until Sonic's lungs fill the maximum capacity before they show up like a millisecond too late. But, uh, you know, I think it's just I've been on this earth breathing for so long, I feel like I'm kind of good at it now, so... Maybe they just respect me more. The boss fight at the end of this is actually pretty cool in my opinion. I like how they take something that you're familiar with from earlier in the level and they use it in a different way, specifically for the purpose of bullying Dr. Robotnik, like, get exploded, nerd! Pushing it up from one of my least favorite stages to my favorite stage, it's Gambling Zone! This is not realistic in the slightest though, because no one's offered me an overpriced drink and I don't hate myself for losing $40 at a blackjack table. Yeah, that's a real thing that happened and I still am not over it. You know how long you have to work to make $40? From the colorful environments to the bumpin' tunes, there's really not anything I dislike about this stage, and I really think it's the best casino stage in the entire franchise, but let's be honest, there are not a lot of very good competitors. Hilltop Zone is next up in the spotlight, and I don't love it, but I don't hate it. I, I mean, that's more than I can say about a lot of the zones in Sonic 1, though. It's a little bit slower than previous stages, but you're never outright stopped in your tracks in too many places, which I appreciate. And any time where you have to use these lifts, they're not exactly mandatory, I would say. So, uh, just take a leap of faith and maybe that'll, uh, lift your spirits. I think the bright blue on the hills here is really nice to look at, and it's even more eye-catching once you get to the spicier parts of the level. And you know what they say, if you can't handle the spice, get out of the lava zone, idiot! Now, not only does Sonic 2 have two water levels that are more than passable, but it also has a cave level that is pretty great. And honestly, I don't know, when you think of caves, I don't really think of wide open areas that are good for building up speed, and that rings true about Mystic Cave, but it never quite reached the level of annoyance for me that Marble Zone and Labyrinth Zone did. There are also a lot of switches and slow level elements that you need to deal with, so honestly, I would say this is probably the closest thing to Sonic 1's level design that's in this game. And of course at this point, I think most Sonic fans would probably jump to talking about that dreaded spike pit that even Super Sonic sees in his nightmares. But since Christian Whitehead is a genius, instead of a temporary soft lock, we now have Hidden Palace Zone. This is a one-act resurrection of an unused Sonic 2 stage with its own unique enemies and music. It sort of reminds me a little bit of Labyrinth Zone in terms of aesthetics and level design, but it feels a little bit more like Labyrinth Zone done right. Also part of this balanced breakfast is an entirely new boss fight. This is apparently where Eggman goes to practice the tuba when nobody's around, and he is so bad at everything he does that he's literally bringing down the house, which is not the way you usually want to do that. It's usually more of a figurative thing. Also, one thing to note, playing this zone skips the rest of Mystic Cave Act 2, so make sure to pick your poison. Speaking of poison, here's Oil Ocean Zone, which is a poison on this entire franchise. Like, I don't even like this zone in Mania. I feel like it's actually even worse because of Act 2, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself now. I guess I could say it looks really nice at least, but you know, bright and appealing things like that will usually kill you if you're not careful, so please do not eat. Why do I eat gummy bears then? Gummy bears are really colorful. I eat those. I'm a hypocrite. The gimmicks are really what kill it here for me. Like, I really don't like the oil that makes you travel at a snail's pace. I get that that's a penalty for falling down there in the first place, but the entire rest of the stage is really slow and boring as well, so why am I just being punished as a whole for just playing the game? The boss fight is at least really easy to cheese though, and I mean, that's not really a surprise to me at this point, because let's be honest, this egg is just not always cracked up to be. And finally, we have reached Metropolis Zone, a zone that is infamous, of course, for its level layout and enemies. I mean, who could forget... Slicers and Asterons. I definitely can't. I see them every time I close my eyes. I haven't blinked in six days. Once again, one-upping its predecessor, Metropolis Zone aims to be exactly like Scrap Brain Zone, except it's about like a hundred times better. You're constantly on the move here, and since most of these gimmicks work on cycles, it's really satisfying to blast through at just the right time before a spear becomes acquainted with Sonic's carotid artery. This is also the only stage that has three acts, so it sort of overstays its welcome since none of the stages really do enough to differentiate themselves from each other. Uh, but who cares? It caps off with a really easy boss fight again before the game is over. Psych! 
it's Sky Chase. More like Y Chase. Or Cry Chase. Or Dry Chase. I really don't have enough rhymes in my brain to describe how much I hate auto scrollers. So let's just move on. Sky Chase delivers you to Flying Battery Zone, which is not actually the name of the zone. It's actually Wing Fortress, and I just keep saying Flying Battery by mistake. The zone starts with Tails getting shot down, and he just kind of like doesn't even react to it. He just kind of accepts his fate. But honestly, his fate's a little bit better than ours because we actually have to play the zone. So if you like vertical platforming, that when you mess up, you fall back down, you gotta redo chunks of level over and over again, this is your stage. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. It's not fun, but at least it's only one act. Because then Sonic gets some help from Tails, who is not dead. Thank goodness. Oh, I didn't see that coming. He jumps onto a space shuttle and uh, exits the atmosphere for what felt like 20 minutes while I was sitting there. I thought the game crashed, actually, while I was waiting for it to happen. Uh, and then, finally, we are at the end of the game. <laughs> Sonic just goes into space, and he freezes into an ice cube, and he shatters, and that's it. It's over. Dead. Okay, okay, I was just joking. But, you know, now we're in Star Wars reference zone, and what is here for you waiting? It is two bosses, zero rings, uh-oh! Which is what I would say if you couldn't cheese both of these bosses really hard yet again. It kind of felt a little bit like a Mega Man game to me because I was like dying a million times trying to figure out how these things worked. But then once I figured out how they worked and got some advice from some of my buddies, uh, well the Silver Sonic fight is over in like 10 seconds because it's just like spin dash, spin dash, spin dash, jump, dash, done, explode, haha. And then the Death Egg Robot fight is like, why was I even scared of you? Like, you can't even hit me if I time my spin dashes right. Like, the AI just doesn't do anything. It's just... It's kind of hilarious. With that, Sonic trashes the Doctor's plans yet again and lives to run through whatever green hills might await him in the future. Players of the Christian Whitehead version can then go back and play the game as either Tails or Knuckles, but no amount of awkward special stage sprites for Knuckles will get me to do that. Sonic 2 is 100% better than the first game, and there is no doubt in my mind about that anymore. But that's got me wondering, do you guys think that the Sonic 2 movie will be better than the first one as well, or do you think it's doomed to crash and burn? Because for once, I think I'm going to do the opposite of what a Sonic fan usually does, and I am going to be hopeful. Feel free to let me know in the comments below what you think about that, and also, after the movie comes out, feel free to come back and tell me I was wrong if I was wrong. But you know, maybe I won't be wrong, because being positive is cool! Sonic the Hedgehog 3! It's... the third one. It's also only about half a game that Sonic Team would end up completing later in one of the most creative ways I've actually ever encountered. That being, of course, slapping these two carts together into this crime against nature. You think God stays in heaven because he lives in fear of what he's created? These days, companies still don't finish their games on time and then just push a huge day one update on you. And if you don't install that, you're either incredibly brave or... You actually liked Cyberpunk 2077. One last thing I'd like to bring your attention to before we get started, and that is the Sonic 3 beta. We recently saw a beta of Sonic 3 get discovered, and there were some interesting details in there, such as the PC port soundtrack confirmed to be the original soundtrack for the game before all of the uh, music controversy set in. And of course, we also saw the birth of the Drop Dash. We did not see its way into a Sonic game for real until 23 years later in Sonic Mania. Either that, or it's one crazy coincidence that these two things look very similar to each other. And, uh, I mean, you know, I used it as a joke a second ago, but you could also subscribe and click the bell if you want to, because, like, I, I make videos once a week, and sometimes YouTube doesn't tell you about them. So it'd be cool if, like, you know, you could see them. Also in the beta, there is an alternate intro sequence for the game showing that Sonic might not have actually collected all of the emeralds back in Sonic 2, meaning that the canon ending of the game would have been different, because of course, in the actual Sonic 3, our boy do be looking pretty blonde. Unfortunately for Sonic though, newcomer Knuckles the Echidna mistakes him for Sonichu and punches the blonde right out of this boy. Knuckles then runs off with Sonic's rock collection, but not before doing the one thing he swore he would never do. Unlike Sonic, I don't chuckle. You make me sick. With questions on their minds and frustration on their faces, the two heroes set off into the forest of Angel Island Zone for a brand new adventure. Now, of course, this is where I would say, here's our Green Hill Zone ripoff of the game, but to be honest, Angel Island Zone is actually pretty different from Palm Tree Panic, Emerald Hill, and Green Hill. See, this one actually has its own gimmicks, whereas the others are just kind of like chilling. Like, you got timed platforms to jump on, you got zip lines all over the place, you really feel like you're delving really deep into the forest. 
You have the charred remains of a once beautiful land destroyed by the schemes of a madman. Wait a minute, that's not a gimmick, that's just, uh, really bad. But yeah, that's a pretty dynamic change, I would say. It's definitely the craziest thing I've seen in any of these games so far, and, uh, I mean, on the bright side, at least with all the trees gone, now we can find those special rigs a little bit easier. These portals take you away to a mystical land filled up with blue spheres, red spheres, star spheres, Britney spheres. Even the land beneath your feet is a gigantic sphere, which... Technically is not too much different than normal, but Sonic could be a flat earther. This could be a totally new experience for him. You know the drill by now. Blue good, red bad, collect them all, claim your rock. That's pretty much it. I'm also kind of finding myself wondering though how Knuckles dropped all of these back into the special zone so quickly after stealing them from Sonic. But then another part of my brain is like, why are you so concerned about realism in a game where animals wear shoes? Just like Sonic 2, collect seven emeralds and bam, Super Sonic is back. You earned it. I'm proud of you. That is not a joke, I am proud of you. You're trying your best, and that's what matters. As the two make their way into the deepest part of the forest, they come across Eggman and his flamecraft, which Tails mercilessly destroys because he is clearly still upset over the missiles that were dropped on them mere moments ago. I mean, honestly, I would be too. Missiles? Kinda cringe. The duo then runs into Knuckles for the second time, and the nerve of this guy? He tells them that they smell bad, and then he sends them to the bath dimension. Hydro City Zone, not debating the name pronunciation with you, is basically a less dangerous chemical plant zone. See, I never really felt like I was going to drown or anything in this level. It's pretty easy to actually get yourself out of the water once you're in it. I mean, there are levers all over the place that'll do just that. But, uh, you know, it is a water level, so therefore, I hate it. But I don't actually, it's okay. I mean, even if you don't like it, it kind of goes by in the blink of an eye anyway, and at the end of the stage, you see Eggman with his newest contraption, which I believe was tailor-made for the purpose of being destroyed by Sonic, because I really don't see any other practical purpose for this machine. Sonic and Tails then find themselves in Marble Garden Zone, not to be confused, of course, with Marble Zone, which is another marble-based location on an entirely separate island. And you know what, for once, I'm actually gonna let Marble Zone win this, because I do not like Marble Garden Zone very much at all. I think comparatively, somehow, you actually are moving at a better pace in Marble Zone than you do in Marble Garden, because they keep stopping you to fight these giant face enemies, or, like, you gotta use the spinners to, like, float up in the air, and they're super sluggish when you're moving around, but then as soon as you hit the ground, you're like, BAM! Ludicrous speed! <laughs> Eggman also thought he was clever by making these badniks that look like spikes, but they're actually springs? This place is a madhouse! Eventually Eggman tries to cave in the entire area on top of Sonic and Tails, but you know, they're too fast for that. So Tails ends up helping Sonic take to the skies in a boss fight that is a lot shorter if you just get a ton of hits on Eggman before he leaves the ground. A forced trip to the carnival is in the cards for our heroes next, and unfortunately for them, they are getting a scathing review from us on Yelp. Because let's look at the facts here, while I was in this place, uh, a dumb idiot rat got into the fuse box and turned off all the power and I stubbed my toe and also I almost drowned in the gift shop. Which would at least be like thematically appropriate if I was at SeaWorld, but like, come on guys, that's just silly. This stage is kind of a mixed bag for me. I mean, overall I love the goofy music and of course the aesthetic is basically like a casino stage except my wallet feels safer. But I really don't like how they separate the entire thing into, like, like, chambers of obstacles to surpass. Like, that's kind of what it feels like to me. It sort of just slows things down a little bit. Not really my cup of tea, but I will give them points for the amazing amount of gimmicks in this stage, such as platforms that uh, rise when you jump off of them. I don't understand it, but it's there. Uh, you got balloons cannons that fire you in every which way, little places to gain a ton of speed, shoot Sonic into the stratosphere, it'll be funny. And of course, the dreaded barrels. You just press up and down on them and they're really not a big issue. I could see how it might have been an issue back in the past when, you know, you couldn't Google anything or read the instruction manual. I'm not gonna give it any more attention than that because it's really not worth the energy. Next up, of course, we have an ice level, which means we are in extreme danger of me making ice puns throughout this entire section. I should really be careful about that, because you guys might start giving me the cold shoulder.
I would say this is definitely one of the most famous ice levels in the entire franchise. Probably the most well-liked as well. It was so well-liked, in fact, that uh, Sonic Team went and stole the name for a level in Sonic Adventure that has almost no similarities with the original. After Sonic practices for the Winter Olympic Games about 15 years too soon, he ends up being thrown into a bunch of caves with emphasis on vertical platforming and, of course, some puzzles here and there. Uh, they're sort of reminiscent of Labyrinth Zone's puzzles back from Sonic 1, except when I play this game, it doesn't make me want to shut off the console. After escaping the caves with his life, Sonic ends up finding Eggman's newest robot that has a handy-dandy platform uh, that he can use to dispose of him, and it just makes me think that Eggman doesn't actually want to win anymore. Or, he's trying to lure us into a false sense of security. Because next up, we've got Launch Base Zone, which actually has a pretty cool boss fight in it. Unfortunately, the game ends off on a bit of a confusing note for me because I don't really like this zone. Like, the layout is kind of gross. It just kind of, like, goes all over the place. There's no consistency, really, and it just doesn't flow very well, in my opinion. Then, of course, this is yet another water stage in this game. You know what? I'm gonna say it. 7.8 out of 10. Too much water. After dispatching one of the weakest bosses I've ever seen in a video game, Sonic does his best GTA impression and steals Eggman's ride, knocks over a civilian that totally didn't have it coming to him, oh no. and lands on a platform attached to a rocket. The perfect place for a slightly more challenging boss. Honestly, this one is kind of challenging, with the spinning spike ball above it is kind of like, oh, it's a little hard to hit the cockpit, and then like it has a bunch of sections, but it's cool. I like it. I can vibe with that. But take care of that thing, and it's smooth sailing from here on out. You have gathered the seven Chaos Emeralds. Say your wish. I want to hear some bitchin' final boss music. Your wish has been granted. And I wish that he had to replay both bosses before this and watch a cutscene every time he loses a life. Wait, what? That's just about the only problem I really have with Big Arm as a boss, but overall, I think it's a really fun and iconic boss fight, even though it's not the most difficult thing in the world. The boss would reappear later down the line in Sonic Generations 3DS, and it would even come complete with its own remix, which is, uh, even better than the original. Or just look up one of those mashups, I bet it sounds really good put together. But, you know, Dimps, thank you for doing that. I, I really appreciate you bringing back the, the Big Arm boy. And that's it! Game over! Please purchase Sonic 3 & Knuckles to continue your adventure. Oh, what's that? It's not out because it's 1994? Oh man, well, flash forward to right now because it's a coincidence the video for it isn't out either. Unless it is, of course, because time might have passed since this was uploaded. That's pretty cool for you, huh? You see, because, like, this is a recording, right? So I'm permanently trapped in this moment in time right now where that video doesn't exist, so I'll never see it. Like, technically, I'm not even real. Speed, platforming, and 90s attitude. These were the ingredients chosen to create the perfect video game franchise. But Professor Naka accidentally added an extra ingredient to the concoction. And Knuckles. Than the rest of them. Continuing from where we left off last time, Sonic and only Sonic arrives in Mushroom Hill Zone. Tails apparently did not survive the run-in with Big Arms, as he is nowhere to be found in this game. Aside from in the footage behind me, because I'm not going to re-record the game just for one joke that I made way later when I wrote the script. Subbing in this time, Knuckles is playable for the first time outside of Sonic 3's competition mode, and here we see the birth of his legendary climbing and gliding playstyle, that hasn't changed much or improved since 1994. And before you say anything, I know he had new moves added to his arsenal over the years in Sonic Advance, Sonic Adventure, but uh, then look at Sonic Mania and he's back to being really boring. So, uh, eh. Now just to get it out of the way, I didn't do a full Knuckles playthrough for this because I don't care about what happens to him, but he does go through Sonic's levels a little bit differently because his jump is pitiful compared to Sonic's. The devs, however, took this as an opportunity to give Knuckles his own storyline of sorts, because it even culminates with a different showdown with Mechasonic, where he harnesses the power of the Master Emerald to become one of the coolest pieces of ignored lore in this entire franchise. Like, I guess we're just gonna gloss over the fact that Robotnik can create a robot that can turn super, and uh, no one will ever talk about it again, except the writers of the non-canon IDW comics? Like, Sega, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but you're sort of squandering your lore's potential here.
Actually, you know what? I think they are aware of it. All right, fellas, you know the drill. This game starts with a green level, as always, but it's actually my favorite one in the entire franchise because of the more jungly aesthetic and the music. This stage also boasts a very unique seasonal transition as you go through the entire zone, and I don't really think there's another place quite like this in the series, so please enjoy your time here while it lasts. Aside from all the pollen, if I went here for real, I would be dead in seconds. As Act 1 concludes, Sonic faces his greatest enemy yet. Deforestation. Put an end to this man and his goofy sound effects. This is a serious issue. Like, where are the frogs gonna live, asshole? In Act 2, Robotnik welcomes us back with open arms. Why are you running? Flying Battery drops in after the Doctor's defeat, and let me tell you, this airship is a lot more... A lot more tolerable. There's a lot less vertical platforming and anxiety, and a lot more gotta go fast and confusing name. I mean, what do they mean, battery, right? Like, I'm not gonna put this thing in my TV remote. The previous joke was an example of someone who doesn't know how to use Google, because in this context, battery obviously refers to... All of this sh**. The options for traversal in the stage include pulleys, poles, and giant fans that send Sonic flying upwards. Man, I was kind of wrong about this stage, right? It really... blows. Andrew, that was the wrong sound effect. There we go, yeah. More top-tier comedy like that waiting for you when you smash that subscribe button. Before we move on, I just wanted to highlight Act 2's boss fight. It's not, like, cool or interesting or anything. I just really wanted to show off this Eggman spray, because he looks really doofy. Like, for real, this fella's glasses to mustache ratio is all out of whack here, and I don't know why. After destroying the airship, Sonic realizes the gravity of his mistakes, as gravity does what it does best, and allows him to fall from a ludicrously high place with absolutely no injuries whatsoever. Just like in real life. Unfortunately for Sonic, though, much like in the movie Final Destination, his death was definitely supposed to happen there, so he will be dead in exactly 1 minute and 46 seconds upon arriving in Sandopolis Zone. Alright, I might be exaggerating a little bit, it's not quite that deadly, but it's still kind of my least favorite part of this game. Like, it sure does try to keep you moving with all these sand falls, but it has way too many moving parts and ends up being a slog to get through regardless. The boss is pretty cool, though. If you recognize this guy, congratulations, you have played Sonic Adventure 2! Now why don't you go do yourself a favor and play a real game, like Animal Crossing Wild World on the Nintendo DS. Finally, we actually have a boss that's interesting because of its gameplay mechanic. You see here, no amount of attacks from this puny woodland creature can destroy this gigantic stone statue. So instead, Sonic has to lead him to the quicksand over on the other side of the screen for uh, one of the easiest boss fights in Sonic 3 as a whole, uh, I believe. With that murder taking place, Sonic heads inside the pyramid for Act 2. Hey there, demons. It's me. Sonic the Hedgehog. If you don't hustle through this area, all the spirits of the people Sonic has killed will show up and they will drag him down to the underworld where he belongs. So that combined with all the sections where you gotta push a switch and then run to the other side of a room in time before the door closes is probably why a lot of the people don't like this level and uh, yeah, I'm right there with you. I really don't like this one very much. But again, the boss is pretty cool. Like it's this gigantic statue and you gotta hit it to reveal the prize inside and then just... <laughs> Following the defeat of Robotnik yet again, Sonic, not ever catching a break, falls into the center of the Earth. But don't worry, it's actually pretty accommodating and has a very aesthetically pleasing palette. Lava Reef Zone's main attraction is, of course, lava. Thank goodness, I'm so parched after walking through the desert. Lava Reef Zone's one of those zones I'm always wishing would return someday, because I think especially in 3D this place would look really stunning. There are plenty of pathways to take, there are tons of little gimmicks and secrets to find, and also there's tons of platforms that will just come careening down from the ceiling and squish you into a hedgehog pancake. Good times. Act 2 should really just be called Reef Zone, because all the lava has gone on worker strike. But don't you worry, I don't think that that lava going away like that will have any cataclysmic repercussions for the island whatsoever. Instead of having a boss in Act 2, the level transitions into Hidden Palace Zone, where Knuckles shows up and he really thinks he can take us in a fight, but what he neglects to remember is that Sonic can dismantle literal death weapons with his bare hands. Poor Knucklehead never stood a chance. Oh no!
Meanwhile, next door, Knuckles' neighbor, the Master Emerald, is kidnapped by Robotnik, and this is where Knuckles learns that we're the good guys. Man, <laughs> that's so crazy. I can't believe we weren't evil compared to the guy who's been turning all of the little animals on the island into robots and hurting people. It's almost like Knuckles uh, isn't that intelligent. Using the last of his strength, Knuckles walks Sonic across the street and then promptly passes out because Sonic was really throwing hands back there and he has nothing left. Sky Sanctuary serves as a bridge zone, not the bridge zone that you're thinking of probably. It's bridges the, the gap between Lava Reef and the final area in the game, Death Egg Zone. This zone's another fan favorite amongst a lot of the people because it's so aesthetically pleasing and memorable, I guess. It appeared later in Sonic Generations and then, of course, Minecraft Sonic way later down the line. And it's also the birthplace and death place of the coolest robot Sonic there is, Mecha Sonic. Full disclosure, a majority of the reason I like this guy the best is because of Super Mario Bros. Z turning him into this crazy, maniacal, robotic menace that Mario, Sonic, Shadow, Luigi, and Yoshi have to deal with. But also, he does have that cool super transformation thing, so like, he's basically just the best classic Sonic character. I do have to say, he doesn't have the most original ideas, however, because I'm really feeling a sense of deja vu fighting this guy. I'm willing to excuse that, though, because this guy actually tries to kill Sonic three times in one zone, which I think is a new record. I don't even think Robotics even tried that hard before. It's too bad that he ultimately fails, and Sonic gets away just in time to catch the bus to Death Egg Zone. And finally, we have a final level I can get behind. See, Death Egg Zone here is this big place filled with a ton of crazy mechanics like admittedly gravity stuff, which I'm not a huge fan of, but thankfully, unlike later entries in the series, this thing does not change what directions you're supposed to be holding, so it's always pretty clear what you're supposed to be doing, and I never felt like it messed me up too much. The stage is also full of these little intermissions where Sonic zooms around on these paths of light, and I uh, didn't realize that at the time, but I actually recorded the music I was listening to into the video footage, but it actually still fits perfectly. <laughs> Now, Act 2's boss originally looks like it's going to be really frustrating, but if you just stand in this teleporter over here and flip gravity every couple seconds, uh, it just kind of can't do anything to you at all and ends up being incredibly easy, and uh, that means we're on to the final boss now. It's big, it's mean, it's got a mean case of the sniffles, it's the Great Egg Robo! But to be fair, I think Robotnik might be a little conceited to just be calling it great, because from my perspective, I would just sort of give it an okay. This dastardly thing is using the Master Emerald to mess with some floating platforms out in space, and Sonic isn't about to let that slide. We gotta save those platformers, man, because without them, the platformer genre can't exist, and that would be a dystopian future that I want no part in. Wiping out the Doctor's latest kaiju creation proves to be rather easy this time around, unfortunately, and Afterwards, this is where the game ends if you don't have all the emeralds. See, Sonic just leaves the Master Emerald there up in space instead of reclaiming it like we were, you know, coming here to do. Uh, seems like a very high IQ move there, buddy. If one does have the Chaos Emeralds, however, Super Sonic hits the scene, travels through a nearby meteor herd until he catches up with the Doctor, and the Doctor is fleeing for his life, knowing full well that he stands no chance against his blonde nemesis. Super Sonic is so overpowered here that he doesn't even lay a finger on this guy to kill him. He just makes him attack himself until finally the Hedgehog is done playing with his prey, and he rushes after his latest robotic victim, destroying the mech, sending Robotnik to... who knows where, he's probably not gonna live for very long in space, and he takes the Master Emerald back down to Angel Island where it belongs. End of story. I am so happy to see that thing back to where it belongs. I'm sure nothing bad will ever happen to it again. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Sonic and Knuckles. But, you know, it was a little bit short. So, I mean, like, if only there was some way to just, like, get a more full experience out of, oh yeah, all you gotta do is plug Sonic 3 into this thing, and it becomes the full package again for no extra cost, for $9.99 a month. Three payments at $9.99 a month, directly to me. Please subscribe. Truthfully, though, during this retrospective, I learned that I'd much rather just play the Sonic and Knuckles half if I were to replay this, because playing the entire thing in one sitting is way too long. And also, Sonic 3 is full of a bunch of water levels and things that I don't like. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna rush back to my cave to avoid all the pitchforks and torches no doubt coming my way. I've still not healed properly from the last time I stated an opinion like this on the internet. Ow. Sonic and Knuckles.
Tales. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will bring this video to a close. I hope you enjoyed this one, and if you made it this far, please let me know down in the comments, because not a lot of people make it to this point, and if you did, it's almost like you're in a secret club. So if you like this video and you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe, click the bell, follow my Twitter, and join the Discord to keep up with more Sonic and other things that aren't Sonic, because I do a lot of things. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to my current supporters, who are... Chaotic Mercenary, Brady Hilkemeyer, Mimic, Noah Wizbios, Danny Lee Dauber, Minty, Ty Little Tech Guy, Jeremy, Dax, Crystal, PM13, Chaos, Dork in a Hat, Mega Traffic Cone, and on Patreon, we have Takayaki Chow, Noah Wizbios again, and John the Real Wawa Luigi. Thank you also to everyone who's supporting me in the $1 tiers over there. It really means a lot, and even $1 can build up over time. And if you would like to become a supporter yourself, please go ahead and click the join button below the video to check out all of the benefits you get, such as getting shoutouts at the end of these videos, and seeing a whole bunch of members-only content, which include bloopers and a whole bunch of other stuff like that. But anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video, and I will see you all next time.